The Adirondack State Park is located in the northern corner of New York State. The six million acre park has a rich social and environmental history and is home to a wide variety of habitats, including old growth forests, wetlands, alpine vegetation, rivers, and lakes. About 130,000 year round residents call the Adirondacks their home. Some have roots here that go back generations, and others migrate, lured by the beautiful landscape. Whatever the reason they live within the blue line, they all become entwined with their environment and have a story to tell. I came to the Adirondacks first in the 1970s as a Paul Smith College student to study forestry. Um, I had been a suburban kid my whole life and so I lived uh, in a very semi-urban area and I had never really been to the mountains. I had done some camping and uh, some hiking in that but I hadn't seen anything like the Adirondacks before I actually came up here to see the college and it just immediately made me feel that this is where I belong, um, that I was very much more connected to nature and that this was a place that needed to be protected. I hadn't really heard much about climate change back in the 70s when I came to Paul Smith College but the big talk at that time was acid rain um, because I was a forestry major it was, we were starting to see a lot of impact to the forest here because acid rain had uh, become such a problem. So you would see impact of trees dying, uh, the needles falling off of white pine trees and all these issues. So, and of course, in my classes, we talked about the problem with acid rain and that uh, it was being caused by uh, pollutants getting into the air. So I knew that there was a connection between, say, greenhouse, greenhouse gases and negative impact to the environment, but I hadn't really heard of climate change into, until many years later, like in the 1990s. You know, detecting climate change is a very difficult thing. Uh, it happens over time. Uh, in some cases, it happens very slowly. In other cases, a little more rapidly, but still, um, it's, it's difficult to detect uh, specific changes that, that are, have occurred or are occurring. So you need to look back in the past. And I'll give you two for instances. Uh, I'm a wild ice skater. I love to skate uh, lakes and ponds throughout the Adirondacks and Champlain Valley. Uh, we have a record of Lake Champlain from the early 1800s to now and that describes what the ice conditions were like. That is, did the lake freeze over or didn't it freeze over? And for the bulk of those years, from the early 1800s until into the 60s and 70s, Lake Champlain froze over every year, shore to shore, Vermont to New York, New York to Vermont. And um, now it's the odd year that Lake Champlain freezes over. Uh, it's hard to think about a moment when climate change is affecting my life. And, you know, I've, it's been, as a scientist, it's been in my world for, for a little while. But one of the moments I can think about that really made me think very critically about climate change was a few years ago when we had a really early spring and all of the trees budded out early and the fruit trees budded out early and then we got late frosts and so that early spring warming um, that instability in weather really really made me think real critically about climate change and how it's affecting the things that the place where I live. Maple and climate change there's a real real um, challenge there because the season can be starting early due to these winter thaws um, and then it also can end abruptly due to really warm temperatures in the spring and so with maple it's it's not about necessarily losing the maple season it's about the maple season being less predictable and also um, more of a boom and bust so really good weather and then really poor weather um, which has always always been the case but more extreme now and more concerning so um, so that's part of it the other part of it is whether or not our trees become active and then um, get damaged by 
colder weather. So active during an early thaw and then free damage by colder weather. So that's a big issue. Um, not to mention climate change. I mean, climate change has a effect on almost every part of our ecosystem. So how it affects forest pests, maybe giving them longer life cycles um, is, is a question as well. I'm entering the fourth year um, where I've been working with the New York State Department of Health to monitor tick-borne diseases here in the North Country, which are on the rise, likely in part due to climate change. Because I've been so involved in, in monitoring for Lyme disease and looking at populations of ticks, never ever dreamed that I would be really finding dense populations of, of black-legged ticks which carry these diseases basically in my own backyard. But in the last few years, I've had the opportunity to really witness the emergence of these, um, of these vectors for a disease that are of, of a lot of concern to humans. Just hearing people, um, my friends and neighbors who say, uh, I'm a little bit afraid to go in the woods, I'm afraid to rake my leaves. Uh, should I check myself for ticks when I come out? That's, that's brand new, that's brand new in the last, I would say, three to five years. Mm -hmm. um, it just makes me realize how quickly changes are occurring. I'm concerned. I mean, I think the emotion that comes with the concern is um, frustration and anger because it's big. I mean, you know, climate change is big. I get very worried for my kids and what the world will look like and what this place will look like um, as it changes. Um, you know, I think the latest models that I heard is, is that, that the environment here will become like the Carolinas. Um, I didn't move to the Carolinas. So I'm not particularly fond of that, and I'm not particularly fond of rattlesnakes. And all of those species are now held in check. So um, I, I just see a completely different landscape. Um, and I am concerned that... Um, not so much the uniqueness of the land, but the feel of the land will change. Uh, my name is Keith Ahrens. I'm currently living in Wilmington, New York, working at the Adirondack Wildlife Refuge. What, we, what our mission is, is uh, education, rehabilitation, and release. So any animals that we get in that cannot be released, we keep them as educational animals to bring them out to the public to educate people f with first-hand experience about the animals such as uh, the black vulture, the black vulture that we currently have that got shot in the wing uh, in a town north of Albany is a huge animal to demonstrate climate change because he should not be up this far north. <laughs> Same thing with uh, the red shoulder, he should have been gone a long time ago, but he was still up here because the environment was still suitable for him, unfortunately. Um, so we go out and we take these animals with us to show people that their actions do have effects on the environment, and uh, seeing the animals firsthand really helps people understand that this is something that they actually do care about. Yeah, so the problem with climate change is, you know, it's, it's part of a, a legacy. It's something we leave for the future. I don't have children, so uh, if we go by the thought that this is the earth we leave to our children, I shouldn't care as much, right? But um, I have uh, young people that I work with, young people that I care about, and I care about humanity and I care about the planet. And so um, even though I don't have my own children to worry about this legacy, I have a, a great attachment to the future generations that are coming here. I, I do believe we have only one Earth. Uh, we're finding new planets. We can colonize other planets. Um, but I don't think that's a viable option. Uh, humanity has a history of ruining where they live and then just moving on to someplace else. And we can't continue to do that forever. So um, I've become very politically active in trying to uh, fight against some of the political changes that are happening now. Um, I try to send 10 postcards every week to politicians telling them uh, that I believe climate change is real, that science is real, and that we can't enact these policy changes that are going to negatively impact the progress we've made. The climate that we had that was, um, uh, that was beneficial to us, that we could grow crops with, that we could grow forests with, that we didn't have likelihood of, 
uh, flooding or extreme storms or forest fires, those things are changing now. The seasonality of precipitation is changing. The amount of precipitation is changing. Uh, the form of that precipitation is changing. Uh, the temperatures are changing. Uh, the seasons are are narrowing or, or spreading, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so it's a uh, those are, those are heritage items. It makes me sad because the natural systems that, we, that I've lived under, that my parents and my grandparents lived under, are changing. And you're going to have to deal with that. You know, climate change, unfortunately, can be a polarizing topic. It can be political. It is political, unfortunately. But in reality, it's just a, it's a base science. It's, a, it's an event that's happening um, that we are involved with. And uh, we have an ability to stop human-induced climate change. Take the steps to change it. Try to do things that help reduce your carbon footprint. Get off of fossil fuels. We're going to have to do it at some time. We might as well do it now. Um, so, so if you need to sacrifice something to help prevent release of carbon dioxide, do it. It's, it's probably not going to be as big of an issue on your life as you might think it is. I think advice to students, I say a lot in my classes, um, don't concentrate on technology so much as gaining an understanding of how things work, of ecology. Um, I think the ecologists of the future will be the ones that will go to for answers because they understand the interworkings of living things with the natural environment and that's what climate change is disrupting. I am guardedly optimistic about the future. I feel like we have an enormous problem, but with an enormous problem comes an enormous potential for opportunity to make change. I think that it's easy to be overwhelmed. I think that there have been times throughout human history where problems have been insurmountable and overwhelming. I'm often drawn back to old Chinese proverbs where they say that the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So I really feel like you, we need to be going one step at a time. We can all be an agent for change, and that sometimes we don't realize the impact of our actions, and that we need to be examples of how we want that change to happen.